Um, good evening and welcome to Lisburn Museum's seventh annual talks program. My name is Paul Allison. I'm the museum manager. 2020 has been a difficult year and many of us have found new and challenging ways of working. In March, we launched our virtual museum in an effort to continue to deliver the museum service during the pandemic. We had a great response and our photographs, videos, workshops and articles on local history reached almost half a million people. Building on this success and with the support of the Council's Good Relations Programme, I am delighted to bring this year's talks programme online for the very first time, live streamed via Zoom and YouTube. While we're disappointed that we cannot meet in the museum, we're delighted to be able to open up our programme to new audiences. Tonight, we are joined by visitors from across the borough, from Dundonald to Glenavy, and even beyond the UK. Can I offer a special welcome to those from the United States and Australia who have registered to hear our talks over the next few months. For those who cannot access our talk tonight, copies will be made available via USB, DVD on our website, and we will be offered as part of our cultural takeout an initiative to help the digitally disadvantaged. Finally, a quick note on Zoom etiquette. Can I ask that you mute your mic microphone? And if you have a question, then please add it to the chat and you'll be invited to address the speaker at the end. Can I introduce Dr. Chris McGill, who is speaking on the East Belfast riots? Thank you, Paul. And can I just start off by saying thank you to everyone who has tuned in this evening. Um, I know these are unusual circumstances to hear a talk, but I uh, really appreciate the interest that's been shown. Um, today I'm going to uh, be discussing the rats in Lisburn and other parts of East Ulster and how they played a role in the establishment of the Ulster Special Constabulary, or the USC, and how they foretold the nature of that police force. I won't go into great detail on the rats because some of the speakers following me in this series of talks will make them the focus of their papers, but I will lay the basis for what happened in East Ulster. I will also briefly discuss the nature of the USC, its membership, lack of discipline, and its use of force. This paper is largely based on research I did as part of a PhD, uh, which was published earlier this year. It focuses on political violence, such as that uh, carried out by the IRA or the USC in two counties, Antrim and Down. But it should be noted that the Special Constabulary itself has not uh, been very well researched. Beyond my own study, there are only two other significant works, both of which have their ideological flaws. The first is Arthur Hess's B Specials, which is very much an official history with very little or no criticism of the USC, often excusing or ignoring some of its members' worst excesses. Then the other study is Michael Farrell's Arming the Protestants, which, while taking a very Republican view of the specials in RUC, is nevertheless a very good starting point for research in this topic. It is full of facts and figures and details very well the organisational structure of the USC. But as of yet, no objective study of the specials exists, and that may well remain the case without the opening of the USC archive, which remains closed even 100 years after the founding of the force. Whether it was with the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force in 1913, the Easter Rising of 1916, or the first shots of the War of Independence in January 1919, it is unclear exactly when we should pinpoint the beginning of the Irish Revolution. However, what is more unclear is when that revolution consumed the minds of Ulster Unionists. For in 1919, while the War of Independence was still in its early stages and confined to the south, worries began to creep into Ulster Unionist minds. Unionist leaders were given speeches voicing their concerns more regularly by the autumn of 1919, showing the conflict was having at least a mental toll in the Northeast and shaping the mindset of the Unionist community. By 1920, the IRA succeeded in pushing the police out of rural and isolated garrisons in much of the South, forcing them to concentrate their numbers uh, the IRA also escalated their campaign, carrying out shootings of police officers as the war descended in areas into tit-for-tat killings. It was only a matter of time before Ulster was affected. The first major case of violence erupted in Derry in April 1920. This occurred amidst the back 
backdrop of union solution control of the London Corporation to a combined force of the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Nationalists, and Sinn Féin councillors in January and the city having its first Catholic Lord Mayor since the 17th century. Other councils, such as those in Strabane, Enniskillen, Armagh and Oma, also came under Nationalist and Republican control. It was therefore in this context that the rioting broke out in Derry in April, and over the next two months, violence continued intermittently, including gun battles between the IRA and police. During this time, the local UVF reorganised in Derry, seized control of parts of the city and engaged the IRA. In late June, uh, 1,500 troops were brought into Derry, but violence continued. Significantly, however, the soldiers worked closely with the UVF to fight the IRA, therefore taking sides in a long-standing communal divide. Using the UVF or local Protestants more generally against the IRA was not seen as an alien idea by many at the top of government, and we will see this theme come up again uh, later in 1920. Further east, unions could be forgiven for feeling removed from developments in the rest of Ireland. Counties Antrim and Down had strong Protestant majorities, and there was little IRA activity in, in, of significance in the region before mid-1920. However, the unionist mindset changed with the aforementioned developments, increased IRA successes in the south, uh, nationalist and republican gains in local elections, and violence in Derry. Then in July came the assassination of a Bambridge war hero, RIC Divisional Commissioner for Munster, Gerald B. Smith, in Cork City. Smith was gunned down by the IRA in Cork's County Club on the 17th of July as he sat with the police county inspector. Smith was a prime target for the IRA because of his gung-ho attitude to the wider conflict. To Smith, shooting and killing indiscriminately by the police should not be discouraged. Uh, a month earlier in this trial, County Kerry, Smith gave a speech to the local police that should they shoot and kill innocent civilians simply for suspecting them of being members of the IRA, they would face no opposition from their superiors. His alleged words, published shortly afterwards when some officers so disgusted with Smith spoke, uh, spoke to the press, were, and I quote, the more you shoot, the better I will like you, and I assure you, no policeman will get into trouble for shooting any man. To, to Banbridge Unionist, Smith's death was a hammer blow to their confidence. His body was taken to Banbridge for burial, and after his funeral on the 21st of July, local Unionists uh, began attacking Catholic-owned property. It should be noted that there was added tension in the air by this time after a series of publications in the unionist media warning of the threat of the IRA and Edward Carson's infamous speech on the 12th of July in which he called on the unionist people to reorganise themselves. Given the history of communal violence in Ulster, it is not in the least surprising that violence broke out. In Banbridge, the destruction lasted a few days, but also spread to nearby Dromore and Lisburn. A few months later, another major incident occurred. On the 22nd of August, RIC District Inspector Oswald Swansea was assassinated in the middle of Lisburn as he returned home from Sunday church service. And that's a picture of Swansea and Smith that I hope you can see. Um, the perpetrators were from the Belfast and Cork IRA and targeted Swansea because of his alleged role in the killing of the Lord Mayor of Cork, Thomas McCurtain in March of that year. The immediate consequence was an outbreak of major rioting in which a large proportion of the Catholic population of Lisburn were forced out of their homes and had all their property burned. Many local businesses were also lost to arsonists, as was the parochial house. Some individuals were also assaulted. Again, the riots spread, albeit to a much lesser extent, in Dromor and Newton Ards. In both outbreaks of rioting in July and August, the authorities faced a dilemma. The police struggled to contain the July riots in Lisburn, even though these were small scale in comparison to the August riots. In the aftermath, uh, aftermath of Smith's funeral on Banbridge, the military was forced to intervene to assist the overwhelmed RIC. The police chose to avoid using more direct tactics, opting for containment over confrontation. In Dromore, however, the police fired shots into the air, but accidentally killed a Protestant man when the bullet ricocheted. The crowd then turned their anger on the police, forcing them back into their barracks. Over the following week, the police were unable to carry 
out their duties and the power vacuum in Dromore was occupied by the military and a civilian patrol. This was significant because the police quickly learned that a confrontational approach may not be the best option for restoring order. In fact, in Dromore, it was counterproductive as they lost all authority for a time over the town. The Dromore experience was not repeated, but the outcome, the forming of a civilian guard, was significant. To reassure the unionist community, a similar initiative was established in Bangor in July. These patrols acted as a support to the police in their efforts to restore order, but they also illustrated how the police were willing to placate unionists who questioned the RIC's objectivity. When the RIC acted against loyalist rioters, uh, their actions were often interpreted as taking sides with republicanism, or at least obstructing loyalists in their resistance to republicanism. During the July riots in Lisburn, police officers repeatedly bat and charged rioters and made six arrests, but such actions reinforced the perception that the police were against unionists. Without military in intervention, local uh, citizens arranged a meeting at which they revived the local UVF in order to aid the police. This was the dilemma. In order to police loyalist rioting effectively, a degree of power and authority for maintaining order was conceded to a loyalist paramilitary organization. Even the army had to limit its response to the riots. A battalion of the Somerset Light Infantry under the command of Brigadier General Hackett Payne arrived in Lisburn on the first day of rioting in August. But even with reinforcements, the authorities were unable to quell the riots. Instead, they attempted to contain the violence with military guards posted at prominent Catholic buildings. In August, some of the civilian patrols were expected to assist the police and military in response to the riots. These were obviously chosen from the Union's community and their responses to the riots were mixed. The UVF proved useless in restoring order in Lisburn as it was completely unresponsive and some of its members were in fact taking part in the riots. The Lisburn Urban Council was therefore faced with an ineffective police force, a military unwilling to confront rioters and a revived UVF that did nothing to help. Solutions were attempted, including shutting off the town's gas supply until peace prevailed. But the solution that worked most effectively was the enrolment of a body of special constables that managed to maintain order in the town by offering assistance to the police. These special constables were enlisted under the Special Constables Act of 1832 and attempts were made to draw them from the more respectable and responsible sections of the community. They were placed under the charge of a recently retired RIC County Inspector, Robert Morrison, given firearms and to fed into small patrols under the command of a servant RIC officer. However, attempts to keep the force respectable were compromised after complaints from the so-called, and I quote, rougher element, prompted by the exclusion of many rank and file orange men. Uh, rather than provoke further unrest, an additional 300 special constables were enlisted, albeit on the condition that they could not carry arms. So why were these developments so important in the story of how the special constabulary came into being? These developments in Lisburn were a microcosm of a wider issue. Unionist leaders and government ministers were contemplating ways of handling the escalation of violence across the northeastern counties. Just like in Lisburn, an objective approach to policing in which loyalists and republicans were treated equally would have turned both sides of a communal conflict completely against the security forces. Just as in Derry in July, there were calls to revive the UVF more generally and use it to complement the police and army. This was the preferred approach by many within unionism. It was their fear that without an organized force, loyalists would simply take matters into their own hands as had happened in the Belfast shipyards where they expelled um, all the Catholic workers on the uh, 21st of July of 1920 in Lisburn, Banbridge and Dremore. Uh, Basil Brook created his own force in Fermanagh out of fear that uh, unrestrained retaliations would otherwise occur and in July 1920 uh, the UVF was officially revived under the control of Wilfred Spender um, who is this man. Um, Spender wrote to James Craig um, soon afterwards to warn him, and I quote, that the Sinn Feiners have goaded our men into a state of absolute desperation and the men feel they are being let down by the government and by their leaders. He asserted that loyalists, and I quote again, intend to take matters into their own hands. In the eyes of leading unionists, 
some, uh, some form of organization was essential as a safety valve against the worst excesses of loyalist violence. He also stressed the increase in suspicion with which loyalists held the government, the police and the army. James Craig wrote on the 1st of September 1920 that, in regard to the loyalists in Ulster, it must frankly be admitted that the rank and file are suspicious of being betrayed by the government. Dublin Castle appears to be entirely out of touch with the feeling in the north, indeed to be prejudicially inclined towards it. If any discrimination is shown by the authorities between the loyalists and the rebels, it is usually in favour of the latter. Evidence of this shown by recent promotions in the RIC, which have almost entirely been allotted to Catholics. It was in this context that James Craig met with members of the British Cabinet uh, a day later on the 2nd of September to demand the establishment of a special constabulary for the six counties that were designated in the Government of Ireland Act to form the new Northern Ireland state. Craig insisted the force would comprise of law-abiding citizens, but in reality, it would be a force designed to alleviate loyalist suspicions of the authorities and a means of restraining those loyalists in their violent outbursts. But developments in Lisbon were undermining the idea that this was possible, even with all the best intentions, to recruit a force exclusively from one side of a deeply rooted communal conflict to act as an objective arbiter in that conflict. To illustrate this, Lisbon can again, uh, Lisbon again uh, can be used as a microcosm of wider issues. In October, there was a mutiny by 300 special constables in Lisbon in response to the handing down of convictions to five of their members for their part in the August riots. It seemed inevitable that another riot would break out until the leader of the special constables, former County Inspector Morrison, promised to use his influence to overturn the convictions. He was successful in calming the situation, but this highlighted a major flaw in the Unionist argument for a special constabulary for all Northern Ireland. Members of the Lisburn Special Constabulary Force knew only too well and demonstrated for all to see the power of their collective action and their ability, ability to bend the authorities to their will. Unsurprisingly, Nashes were strongly opposed to the Special Constabulary. Initially, however, the, the Lisburn specials received positive reviews from the Nationalist press. After a row broke out in uh, Market Square in Lisburn between Catholic and Protestant women, at the end of September, an ominous crowd of unionists gathered, and the special constables had no qualms in dispersing them with a baton charge. And I think that uh, argument started after the Catholic women called the Protestant women Carson's pigs. But the honeymoon did not last. When plans for the official uh, special constabulary were made public, uh, Nash's opposition focused on the predictable religious uniformity of the proposed force. Joseph Devlin, Nash's MP for West Belfast, told Parliament that the Ulster Special Constabulary would be made up of the very people who expelled Catholics from their jobs and homes, but that they would now be armed with rifles instead of sticks and stones. Republicans agreed. Roger McCourty of the Belfast IRA and one of Swansea's assassins stated years later that the specials were, and I quote, merely the orange mobs under a different name. The Liberal press aired their opposition to the scheme with one newspaper calling the USC the most inhuman expedient the government could have devised. Even some in the upper echelons of the RIC were nervous about arming large numbers of Protestants, particularly in hitherto peaceful areas where it was felt the specials would increase tensions rather than maintain harmony. Nevertheless, the Union's leadership strongly advocated for the USC and they received the support of the British government. It would consist of three sections, the A, B and C specials. The A specials were full-time constables employed for six months at a time and operating alongside the regular police in platoons. Normally, the A specials work away from home outside their county of origin. The B specials were part-time, received no regular pay, but did receive a small annual allowance to cover expenses and patrolled their local areas under the direction of the RIC. And I should point out, however, this uh, RIC uh, supervision uh, was rescinded and not always complied with. Finally, there were the C specials and they were reservists and uh, played an almost insignificant role in this period in most areas. I think they played more of an important role in uh, parts of Belfast, but throughout Northern Ireland, uh, they were largely unseen and unheard of. 
The DSC was to be recruited within the six counties that would form Northern Ireland, and the initial figures proposed for recruitment were 1,500 A specials and 19,500 B specials. By the end of 1920, the ranks of the A specials were almost full, and in January 1921, their numbers exceeded the original recruitment target. As for the B specials, recruitment was rather slow in most areas. In counties Antrim, Down and Derry, for instance, the total number of applications by the end of January 1921 was only 1,541, or a mere 19% of the target number of recruits in those counties. And I have a graphic here just to demonstrate that. Um, I think, how did, yep, that, there we go. So as you can see from this, um, this shows the uh, applications to the B specials and the recruitment uh, numbers versus uh, the number of authorized uh, positions as a percentage. So the blue is that number of applications and you can see only in three counties there's over 50% and in Tyrone they're dead eager to get into the B specials. Uh, and then the authorities themselves were not very eager to actually recruit that many people into the B specials in most counties. Only in Tyrone again did they fill 81% uh, of the of the positions by the end of uh, January 1921. So I think that there can tell us a little bit about um, the attitude towards the B specials from some within the unions community. A lot of people just weren't eager to join, and uh, the authorities themselves weren't eager in, in most uh, counties to actually bring people in. But an even more interesting statistic is that by the end of the truce, uh, several months later, um, or by the time of the truce, several months later, the B specials still had not received enough applications to fill the total number of positions authorised. In contrast to this, counties with larger, as I've just said, larger Catholic populations, such as Armagh and Tyrone, some more applications. And uh, as you can see there, Tyrone, uh, the number of applicants exceeded the available positions uh, well before January 1921, in fact, uh, by the first week of December 1920, they'd uh, achieved that figure. So it should be asked then, who actually joined the Ulster Special Constabulary? This, like many other questions about the USC, cannot be answered adequately because of the continued closure of the USC archive. However, I did ma manage uh, during my PhD to access a large sample of recruitment files for the B Specialists in County Down uh, for the 1920 and 22 period which gives good insight to who was in the force from its inception. But first, let us remind ourselves of the persistent perception of the USC as the orange bob. It is widely held that the USC's critics, uh, by the USC's critics that its rank and file consisted of the dregs of unionist society, that only the very worst sort of this was admitted so that the greatest havoc could be wreaked upon the nationalist population. To this day, historians still reference the belief that the UVF transformed into the USC in 1920, but this simply was not the case. Granted, many former members of the UVF did join the USC, of course some must have, but the USC was a new force and its membership was broader than has previously been believed. However, this is not to say that the USC was not almost entirely Protestant and did not commit atrocities. To make more sense of the specials, let's look closer at the membership of the B specials in 1920 to 1922. So first, uh, there's the religion of B specials. The nationalist assumptions on the religious composition of the USC have been proven correct. It was undoubtedly a Protestant force. Accusations from the Irish news that the USC would exclude Catholics prompted a threat of legal action against the newspaper from Ernest Clark, the assistant under secretary in Belfast. It was Clark's belief that Catholics would, uh, should and would join the force, but his optimism was not widely shared. It should be pointed out uh, that Clark was an English civil servant. Uh, it took him a couple of months to understand the uh, sectarian defied in, in Ulster. Now, given one purpose of the USC was to placate loyalist anxieties about security, the recruitment of Catholic special constables was unlikely to satisfy the more restless elements within unionism. Many unionists, moreover, including some in official circles, did not trust Catholic police officers. One special constable from Clark Mills in County Antrim, for example, complained in a letter to James Craig, 1921, that, and I quote, from the day I arrived there in Clark Mills, 
I was subject to great provocation by members of the regular police, some of which I can truthfully say and will stand over and confirm that if they are not Sinn Féiners, they have immense sympathy towards them. I will say that not even in one station, but in fact, every station you can find them. The RIC was a predominantly Catholic uh, police force and unionists by 1920 held it in great suspicion for this very reason. Therefore, allowing Catholics to join the USC in any great number would keep those suspicions alive. As Ricardo, uh, County Commandant of the USC in Tyrone warned, to allow the specials to become mixed was to destroy the security and loyalist minds of their state. So faced with the Union's resistance, the disapproval of the USC by the Catholic Church and the targeting of Catholic police officers by the IRA, not many Catholics joined the USC. In Down, only seven out of a sample of 536 B specials whose application forms I looked at, uh, who joined between November 1920 and December 1922 were Catholic, or it's a percentage that's only 1.3%. This was undoubtedly a Protestant police force. But was the USC simply the UVF by another name? The persistence of the belief that it was is unsurprising given the openness with which unionist leaders had toyed with the idea of reconstituting the UVF as a constabulary force. Edward Carson had suggested arming Northern loyalists to police Ulster districts as early as April 1920, and efforts were made in July of that year to revive the dormant uh, UVF as a precursor to a new police force. James Craig confirmed in a letter in January 1921 that Wilfred Spender, the leader of the UVF, has placed the whole of the Ulster Volunteer Force machinery at the disposal of Colonel Wickham, who was the leader of the uh, USC and later the first Inspector General of the um, uh, RUC. Consequently, Nashus interpreted the USC as the UVF restored in an official capacity, fully armed and equipped by the government. In some cases, uh, UVF units and other loyalist forces were integrated into the USC uh, quite openly. Uh, this was reported the case in Comber, County Down, and Lurgan, County Armagh. Furthermore, some USC commandants had previously led loyalist paramilitary groups, including the UVF. Uh, Sir Basil Brook, founder of the Fermanagh Vigilance Force, which was uh, another, uh, just a bit like the UVF, a, a paramilitary force. He was appointed the USC uh, County Commandant for Fermanagh. Similarly, in Balamina, the B Special District Commandant was George Young, a former UVF commander. And in Armagh, the local UVF leader, John Webster, became the sub district commandant of the B Specials. However, uh, these may have been isolated examples, notable by their exception. Uh, the County Down B Special application forms required each recruit to provide personal information that can shed light on whether its members were previously members of the pre war UVF. Some insight can be gathered from analysis of the ages of the special constables. So assuming that, this, that the Ulster volunteers had to be 16 years of age or above, it is possible to surmise that a significant number of B specials had never belonged to the pre-war UVF. I'm not sure if the pre-war UVF had an official minimum age, but I don't accept that a child age 13 who may have joined would have been uh, you know, a, an Ulster volunteer. He certainly wouldn't be in my eyes. 42% uh, of the B specials uh, in 1920 to 22 that I looked at were under the age of 16 in uh, 1914. It can therefore be assumed that a very significant proportion of the USC was too young to have joined the pre-war UVF. Uh, for whatever reason, the UVF struggled to recruit members in 1920. Police intelligence in East Ulster recorded little increase in its membership. It seems likely that even if many members of the revived UVF had joined the USC in 1920, they would have composed only a small part of that force. The USC, being much larger than the revived UVF, was inevitably forced to recruit many men who did not belong to the Ulster Volunteers. This is not to say that the USC was not uh, viewed as a loyalist force. Uh, potential recruits and existing members often stressed their loyalty in order to win preferential treatment. 
One former special constable wrote to James Craig pleading for reinstatement to the USC following his dismissal, repeatedly attesting his personal loyalty to the Unionist Party and to the British Empire. He believed that his involvement in the pre-war UVF and his wartime army service had earned him the right to a place in the USC. Another expelled member, William Beck, referred to himself as, and I quote, an old soldier and staunch unionist, a staunch unionist in his appeals for reinstatement. Loyalty was clearly a key qualification for the specials, and being a former officer volunteer was a strong indicator of such loyalty. But that is not to say that the B specials were recruited solely because of their loyalty. There, were, there was a clear preference for people who could afford to volunteer their time, uh, such as those with less demanding jobs, and for people who knew their locality, particularly in rural areas. So farmers and postmen were viable members. Also, unmarried men were preferred as they had fewer obligations at home, while the young, over half the base bachelors were under the age of 25, brought energy, enthusiasm, and a conspicuous lack of war weariness with them. The USC offered its members a sense of purpose, belonging, and status, things of added value in a depressed economy. For the young members who did not take part in the First World War, either through choice or being too young to volunteer, the specials offered a chance for them to do their part in defending their country. It was noted in local newspapers that young men joined in larger numbers after rising speeches by recruiting sergeants at rallies. Lieutenant Colonel Goodwin, County Commandant of the USC in Antrim, explicitly stated in a speech in Ballymena that ex-servicemen had already done their bit for their country and that it was the turn of the younger generation to step up. In an effort to stir the to stir the patriotic passions of young Protestant men, the specials were often compared to soldiers on the Western Front. The status with being in the USC was made strikingly evident through the offence and favours bestowed on local contingents of specials by town mayors, uh, some often through dances for them and, uh, and held other offence in their, in their honour. So it bestowed a degree of uh, pride uh, in the local area if, if you were a member of the B specials. Conversely, it was made clear that those who did not join were shirking their responsibility and not showing their loyalty and worth to their community. There is therefore a certain level of nuance in the recruitment process for the USC. There was no simple lift and shift approach that saw all of the UVF transfer its members to the USC. It should be remembered that the UVF in 1913 and 1914 did not exist in the same way in 1920. When attempts to revive it were put in place, there was a poor response from former members. As discussed, this could have been down to, this, to several factors, key among them being war weariness of those who fought in the First World War and age. Some also volunteers were probably past their best years in 1914, never mind in 1920. And it should be noted that joining the original UVF in 1913 did not guarantee that one would see action. The movement was, after all, raised to threaten the use of force with the hope of never actually needing to follow through. But joining the B specials was a different matter. The enemy, the IRA, existed across the Northeast and were likely to be engaged. All of this, however, does not remove one accusation levelled at the Ulster Special Constabulary that it was a sectarian force that harassed and carried out atrocities against Catholics and Nationalists. There are many examples of reprisals, and I want to focus in on one of these incidents today, just to illustrate what I mean by a reprisal and why the specials carried them out. And that incident is the killing of three Catholic men in Cushendall in June 1922 by the A specials. On the 30th of June 1922, the Ballymena Observer printed a short article stating that an IRA ambush had been carried out uh, in Cushendall in the Antrim Glens against a patrol of soldiers and police. It claimed that four of the attackers had been killed and that there were no casualties among the Crown forces. The police were members of the 52nd platoon of A specials based in Ballymena and the soldiers were from the Green Howards under the command of Major Brad Moss Blundell. When the A specials gave evidence immediately after the event claiming that they were ambushed and had no choice in returning fire doubts began to surface about the ferocity of such claims. Joseph Devlin, the nationalist leader in the Northeast, wrote to Winston Churchill telling him that the statements of the A specials were false and that the locals in Cushendall would corroborate this. Even in Unionist circles, there was growing unease as Wilfred Spender, 
uh, cabinet secretary to the Northern Irish government and former UBF leader, alerted a um, colleague that he had taken, and I quote, steps to get in touch with the old UVF and got back a very disquieting report. As there were British soldiers involved in the incident, Churchill was obliged to launch an inquiry, which he duly did by sending an English barrister, F.T. Barrington Ward, to Cushendall. Evidence was heard from 58 witnesses between the 28th of August and the 4th of September, and their testimony turned the official story on its head, posing a major challenge to the Northern Irish government's security policy. Uh, Barrington Ward uh, discovered that on the night of the 23rd of June 1922, four cross sea tenders, uh, they were the lorries that uh, uh, the army and police used uh, back in the early 1920s, uh, three of which carried troops from the Green Hards and one carrying A specials, drove to Cushendall. Upon reaching the hills outside Waterfoot, a village just to the south of Cushendall, Sergeant David Campbell McLean, commanding officer of the A specials, Recall that, and I quote, a party of men were noticed on a rise about 300 yards on the left of the road. I ordered the tender to halt and challenge the party. The men in question, however, had not waited, but as soon as they saw the tender, they ran. They were challenged and refused to halt. By my order, fire was opened. The men retreated up the hill towards Cushendall, and following a brief but fruitless pursuit, the Crown forces returned to their vehicles. As they approached Waterfoot, they picked up a, an 18-year-old uh, man called James McAllister, who had been cycling from Waterford towards his home. McAllister was roughed up by the specials and brought with him to Cushendall. On entering Cushendall, Major Moss Blundell's lorry stopped outside the RUC barracks. And uh, if you've ever been to Cushendall, if you enter from the south along the coast road, the police barracks are still there, and it's quite a distance outside the centre of the village. So Major Moss Blundell was the most senior uh, officer that day. Uh, was not in the centre of the village for what was about to happen. Um, and the other two lorries of soldiers, one turned left and right at the crossroads in the centre of uh, Cushendall. The A specials, however, they went into the centre and stopped at the tower that is uh, at the crossroads, and they dismounted and opened fire. The exact details, as is always the case, are unclear, but what is certain is that three men ended up shot dead and two others were wounded. As was typical for a summer's evening, the centre of Cushendall was busy with young folks socialising and adults on their doorsteps and sitting out in front of their houses talking. All those present uh, when the specials arrived testified that nothing untoward had occurred, no ambush, that people were doing what they did on any other night, and even the local RUC who had just finished their evening patrol corroborated this. But without getting into the details of the witness statements, uh, those are all detailed in my book, uh, where I cover this incident in much greater detail. What happened, in short, is as follows. The A specials dismounted when they entered the centre of Cushendall, shouted an order for residents to get indoors and opened fire. Locals standing at the shops at the crossroads scattered, some going into the shops and several young men running towards the shore. One of these men, Dan O'Lone, was struck by a bullet in the leg but survived. Witnesses recalled what happened next. James McAllister had been picked up outside the village and was forced down from the back of the specials lorry, making, and I quote, terrific screeches and pleading for the sake of God not to kill him, according to one resident. He was dragged across the street to an alleyway behind McDonald's shop, which is still there today in the form of barbers, and shot in the back of the head. The specials then entered McDonald's shop. There, there they found and interrogated a 15-year-old girl Lily McConnell, and two men, uh, Pat Gore and John Hill. Hill was taken outside and shot in the head, while Pat Gore's brother, John, who was hiding in the front of the shop, was discovered and also shot dead. Pat Gore was harassed and asked what his job was. Pat said that he was just out of the army, having served in the First World War. In response to this, the special accused him of being, and I quote, one of the bastards who shot Wilson, a reference to the IRA assassination of Sir Henry Wilson the previous night in London, and it's widely believed that this incident was carried out as a reprisal for uh, the killing of Wilson the previous day. Pat was then taken outside and told to run, but he refused to do so. Instead, he was forced at gunpoint back inside and shown his brother's body, 
At that point, when he realised his brother John had been killed, he ran out onto the street, pursued by the special who had levelled his revolver at him. Gore was fortunate to run into two local specials, Constables Gillen and McConnell, and a military officer. Observing the special brandishing, brandishing his revolver, uh, Constable McConnell ordered him not to shoot Gore as he was an ex-soldier. According to Gore, the special responded by threatening McConnell. He says, I should not think that much of shooting you. When questioned about this, McConnell confirmed the account. He said, true, there was a man there with a revolver and pointing it at Pat Gore. I said, don't shoot that man. He's not long out of the army. The man with the revolver did make some expression of that sort. So there's a fast amount of evidence against the specials that night. There were no independent witnesses that confirmed that they saw an ambush. The local police, like Constable McConnell, corroborated key aspects of the evidence provided by eyewitnesses, and perhaps damning most of all was the fact that no casualties were sustained by the Crown forces, no bullet holes were found in their vehicles or on the buildings immediately behind them, despite uh, their claim that the ambushers shot at them from a mere five metres away. Uh, Barrington Ward was clear in his assessment, and he said that no one except the police and military ever fired at all. So why is this important? Controversial offence such as the killings at Cushendall would come to define the image of Northern Ireland security forces. The formation of the USC was created almost exclusively from the Protestant population during a period of communal conflict, and inevitably bestowed a degree of legitimacy on what was essentially a state-backed loyalist paramilitary force. Paradoxically, however, it was also hoped that the USC would remain impartial in upholding the law. It was expected to work alongside conventional state forces, the regular police in the army, that had been recruited on a broader non-sectarian basis. This is before the RUC um, became a much more Protestant, almost exclusively Protestant force uh, in later years. But it was never going to succeed. It, uh, it didn't help that when such incidents such as that in Cushendall occurred, the Northern Irish government had little interest in instilling discipline. For example, Craig's government ignored Barrington Ward's assessment established its own inquiry and concluded that there was an ambush by ignoring the evidence of all the locals and admitting that they could not accept that the soldiers and specials could lie. So why did such incidents happen? There has always been a belief that the USC was deliberately made up of the rougher elements of the Unionist population. One Catholic RIC officer who experienced working with the specials compared them unfavorably to the black and tans who were, in his words, perfect gentlemen in comparison to the Ulster Specials. Uh, the IRA Chief of Staff and the First Guard Commissioner, Ono Duffy, attributed the poor discipline of the USC to the fact that it was composed of mobsters recruited from the streets. There is some evidence to indicate that militant recruits were intentionally sought. Demanding more recruits in January 1921, one district commandant reportedly declared, the younger and wilder they are, the better. So was this Commandant's desire reflective of the USC as a whole? And if so, does this explain the forces falling into excesses? The answer to that question is likely no. For a start, there was a fetting process whereby all candidates were required to apply to a local justice of the peace prior to appointment before their evaluations were then reviewed by local RIC district inspectors. This process was intended to filter out undesirable applicants. There are many examples of some applicants being rejected because the applicant was untrustworthy or had previously broken the law. The exclusion of such individuals uh, reflected the aspiration of Ernest Clark that only men of unquestionable fidelity and efficiency be enrolled as special counsel. Charles Wickham similarly expressed his belief that recruits to the USC should display discipline, self-restraint and impartiality. He also recorded his regret and concerns when cases of poor discipline arose. After one incident in 1921, he was reportedly, and I quote, a little depressed, fearing that the incident might lead to the condemnation of the whole scheme of special constabulary. It was his opinion, however, that they were bound to find some misfits out of 2,000 men. As these examples illustrate, the authorities sought to exclude undesirables from the USC. 
The fitting process, although hasty and inadequate, was intended to achieve this end. But while the process was arguably unsuccessful, it was not the intention of the authorities to recruit the wider elements of Protestant society, although it should be noted that in some areas, very well-known, uh, very bad people uh, were led into the force, such as in Belfast, where Buck Alec, a Belfast gangster, uh, was able to become a sea special. And he was uh, one of the leaders of a very violent um, paramilitary force in Belfast. But that does not seem to have been the case throughout the rest of Northern Ireland when it came to recruitment. It's more likely that the reprisals carried out by the specials were due to a blend of certain factors and circumstances than a deliberate recruitment process designed to terrorise Catholics. First, there was the anxiety of being part of a force that was the primary target for the IRA. Special constables were engaged in a prolonged conflict in which they remained under constant attack of, or threat of attack, uh, whether in their barracks, on patrol, or at home. They faced an enemy that they rarely, if ever, encountered in, con in conventional military scenarios. The IRA's guerrilla tactics allowed it to blend in with the civilian population enabling it to strike at unlikely times and places. And being a special constable made you a target. George Wickham, for example, acknowledged this in a letter to Ernest Clark, writing that one special constable residing in a mixed area uh, was labelled a marked man because of his service. The mental strain of USC service was compounded by the inadequacy of the training A and B specials received. This was particularly the case for B specials whose training amounted to two weeks and was clearly inadequate for a conflict that warranted the deployment of professionally trained soldiers. This had real life consequences as specials often fired their weapons prematurely during incidents. In March 1922, W.A. Sanford, Commandant of the A specials in Uri, gave a shocking assessment of the specials when asked about their suitability, suitability for regular police work. He said, I think you would have great difficulty in getting reliable men. You cannot take 50% of the present specials. About 10% of them are suitable for the regular police. There was also the problem of leadership. In the Cushion Doll incident in July uh, 1922, the A specials were led by Sergeant McLean. He was the commanding officer at that incident, but he was not the commanding officer of the platoon nor was he even the second in command. And this is a theme that constantly comes up, specials involved in incidents without proper leadership present. And added to this was the over of specials to show that they were on top of things. The USC was under pressure from their community, from the Protestant community, to eradicate the Republican threat. But the reality was that USC duty was often mundane and frustrating. Most specials, particularly in predominantly Protestant areas, did not encounter the IRA. For some, the only way to do what was expected of them was to go looking for the IRA. Hence, when, in, when A specials entered Cushendal, long suspected of harboring members of uh, the IRA, they felt they were surrounded by the enemy. This fed in neatly with the assumption that all Catholics were supporters of, or at least in sympathy with, the IRA. The near total exclusion of Catholics from the USC strengthened the perception of Catholics as a disloyal minority, reinforcing their association with, with republicanism. And this prejudice was further strengthened by the belief that civilians were assisting the IRA in areas such as the Glens of Antrim, where republicanism was a bit more active. Such assumptions influenced the attitudes of state forces dispatched to the Antrim Glens and other so-called disloyal areas. Consequently, local people, such as those encountered by the A specials on the hills outside Cushendal or in the centre of the village, were often considered to be uh, IRA volunteers or sympathisers. And this explains the confident military assumption in the immediate aftermath of the Cushendal incident that all those who had been shot belonged to the IRA. All of these points are strong indicators that uh, USC reprisals and acts of harassment and intimidation were in part due to the circumstances in which the specials operated, but this cannot be used to remove the blame entirely from the governments in London and Belfast and the hierarchy of the RUC and the USC. It all comes back to the nature of the USC. It was created to placate unionist fears over security and to manage the inevitable loyalist violence towards Catholics. If the government or police hierarchy were to clamp down too harshly on miscreants in the USC, 
they would run the risk of alienating them, pushing the more extreme elements away from the USC and losing any influence over how they conducted their counter-revolution. This is partly why after Kushendal in June 1922, the Northern Irish government did nothing to find out who was responsible for shooting James McAllister, John Hill and John Gore. But by affording the normal procedure of discipline and fairness, the authorities created a permissible environment in which loyalists felt in power to act how they wished while also sowing deeper seeds of discontent within the nationalist and Catholic community. But all of this could have been predicted, and in fact was predicted by some, as soon as civilian patrols, branches of the UVF and locally recruited special constables were given varying degrees of authority in the aftermaths of the riots in Lisburn, Banbridge and Dromore in the summer of 1920. They used their collective power then to restrict the power and authority of the police and place these in the hands of groups of loyalists. The alternative in Lisburn in October 1920 when 300 special constables mutinied would have been another violent outbreak. And loyalists used this threat of collective power to influence security policy in the pivotal formative years of Northern Ireland as a whole. And I will finish there and I'm happy to take any questions. So if you have any questions, can you drop them into the chat now? <clears throat> um, I'd just like to thank Chris for a really interesting talk and um, I've been reading your book uh, recently and, and really enjoyed it. And I was going to get started and ask you an um, easy question. Um, why has loyalist violence and its motivations um, been so poorly researched or, or looked at? Um, I thought that was going to be an easy question. <laughs> um, I've, I've often spoke or talked about this with uh, some of the lecturers down at Queen's. Um, I think because when you look at the, the, the movement in history in Ireland, it's moving towards uh, the, the collapse of British control and uh, greater independence for, for, uh, Irish, for, for the Irish. Um, so the War of Independence, for example, is seen as a period of pride for, for Republicans. They, they gained something, whereas Unionists lost. They lost 26 counties. So people from the Unionist community and the Loyalist community don't really look too much into their own history, I don't think. Um, it's going to be quite interesting to see how the centenary of Northern Ireland's establishment will be, will be um, conducted. But uh, there seems to be less pride taken on one side compared to the other. And I think a lot of the historical attention has therefore gone to, um, to, the, to the Republican campaign for independence rather than the loyalist violence that w was a reaction to that, uh, to that um, campaign. Uh, if that answers your question, Kieran. Yep, um, I wonder if I can be cheeky and, and ask yep. a quick uh, follow-up question. Um, so one of the interesting parts of your book is um, you try to uh, look at some of the motivations behind um, the riots in Lisbon, and that's something we're uh -huh. particularly interested in here at the museum, obviously. And uh, you seem sort of um, wholly unsatisfied, dissatisfied with uh, sectarianism as a motivation. I know some authors have put that forward as a prime motivation. And you, you give a host of other motivations, and you, and you say and you show that the violence had a certain form, that there was a pattern to it, that it was a a particular type of violence, and I thought it was really insightful, it was really interesting. I wonder if, if you'd like to talk about it a wee bit. Yeah, like, uh, I would definitely say that the, the, the violence was definitely sectarian, um, but there was much more to it than just simple sectarians. It wasn't just going out and being of Catholics for the sake of it. Uh, there, there, it's much more nuanced than that, so uh, it was all to do with territory. The fact that Swansea was killed in a town that was seen as a unionist of Protestant town, and it was predominantly a Protestant town, um, it really triggered a loyalist reaction that like had never been seen before in, in East Ulster, outside Belfast. Um, and you can see this throughout, um, throughout Ulster at the time. If, if something happened, you, you even, even see it today whenever a, um, when it comes to territory, if, a, if a, an Orange Order parade goes through a nationalist area, it's, uh, it sparks something. But if it happens in a Protestant area, it, it doesn't. And as long as the IRA violence was maintained and or uh, kept in the south of Ireland, it didn't really trigger too much of a reaction in the northeast. Uh, so there was that aspect of territory. Once it seemed to encroach on uh, unionist territory and in the unionist mindset, 
it, it triggered a, a reaction. Um, but there was also, there was also that, that, that also uh, affected how the finance was carried out. So it wasn't so much, um, it didn't go on a killing spree in, in Lisburn. Uh, as far as I know, only one person died, and it was, well, other than Swansea, obviously, but as a, as a result of the, of the rats, there was one body found in the uh, boot factory in Lisburn uh, that was burnt down. Uh, no one knows who it was, um, but they, 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 they would have found Catholics, maybe uh, give some of them a bit of a hiding, but that was as far as it went. They never killed uh, a lot of them, or any of them, in fact, and I think that's quite significant because it was almost an assertion of uh, power of one community onto another. Uh, uh, this is our territory, this is our town, get out of it. Oh, but you can come back at some point, but just remember who's in control here. And I think, I think there was a lot more depth uh, to, to understanding the finance than simply saying it was a sectarian riot, I think. Okay, um, thanks very much, Chris. We have some questions um, from uh, Zoom group chat. I'm going to invite Kieran Glennon, who is a fantastic author in his own right, um, if he would like to ask a question to Chris. Uh, um, first of all, oh. Chris, um, congratulations on the book. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I have a question, and it relates to um, the recruitment into the specials, we say, after the Northern Ireland government took responsibility for security and policing in the north after November 1921 because the specials have been stood down under the, the terms of the truce in July and from then through to the end of the year you had the formation of various other unionist loyalist paramilitary groups such as for example the, the Imperial Guards. So whenever the northern government got control of policing back and revived the specials. They then set up a C1 class of the specials. And was it a case of whatever about not sort of importing the old UVF wholesale into the specials, that these newer paramilitary groups like the Imperial Guards, were mm -hmm. they brought in to the, the C1s and to the specials as a way of channeling them or disciplining them or whatever? Um. It's a good question. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to answer that because the uh, the USC archive is still closed. So seeing exactly who joined on a broad scale is very difficult. I, mean, I, had, to go, I had to jump through hoops to get access to the County Down B Special recruitment uh, files. Um, but I do know that in 1922 there were key paramilitary figures in the specials. I give the example of Buck Alec. Um, and there was certainly after the truce a lot more competition from from paramilitary forces for for personnel essentially. Um, so there there is a likelihood that there was um, there was a change in the recruitment process, um, but I can't say for certain if uh, you know the degree to which that uh, happened. Unfortunately, as I say, with with that archive closed, I like to get names and uh, compare that to. You know, the list of people in paramilitaries, if that if that was possible, it's very very difficult to 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 to, to do that without without access to the archive. But I, in my research, I haven't seen any any letters or notes that completely confirm that. Um, I feel that doesn't really answer your question, Kieran. If you, if you're still there. Oh, sorry, sorry, I had me turned off. Um, okay. No, it, it's a fair point. I mean the. The archival access is the key to the whole thing, really, isn't it? Yeah, there's. I, I would love to have done a study on just the specials, but I can only do a couple of chapters, really. That, that's how limited the material was. Yeah, you have to look at, say, the the papers of the prime minister or the finance papers to try and get snippets of things. Um, but to get the bulk of the material, it's still still largely closed off. Um, I have tried over the last few years to get access, but you need to have the executive up and running, which wasn't the case for a few years. And now with COVID, um, I can't get anyone to sign off on a freedom of information request. So, uh, yeah, I'll let you know when that happens, though. <laughs> Thanks very much. No problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Connor has a great question, but just before we go to Connor's question, it's worth jumping over to our YouTube um, channel where Alan Elder has asked, 
how active were the IRA in East Ulster in the 1920s? Uh, they, they were moderately active. Um, they were very, they were, they were, their most active period would have been with the Spring Offensive in uh, 1922. Um, the, but before that, there was very small scale. You know, there was a raid on a police barracks in Cross Gar, for example, that sort of thing, but it was at shambles. They, I think they went into the building next door and blew their wall going into the wrong side. Uh, out, out instead of going into the, the police barracks, is they were very amateurish. Um, but after the uh, during the spring offensive, uh, there was a bit more activity, but it was very poorly organised uh, across the north. Uh, the IRA and different uh, divisions launched their offensive at different times, so there was no um, there was no um, uh, combined attack on the Northern Ireland government. It happened in stages, so that the response from the authorities could be could be carried out much more uh, effectively. Um, but when you read the IRA uh, statements from the time uh, in the Bureau of Military History, the, the East Ulster IRA and Antrim and Down, uh, they, they all said that once the B specials came into force, it was, it was good out to them. They found it very difficult to operate because so many local Protestants who knew who they were were now armed and could simply go after them. Um, they were, the IRA would have been more active in the glens of Antrim, although they didn't have that much support from the people there. Um, people in Antrim and Down were still quite supportive of the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, under Joseph Devlin, um, and Sinn Féin struggled in the area. So it was quite strange that uh, the, the, the specials in 1922 decided to go into Cushendall and attack people uh, in a place, yes, where the IRA were active, but where they didn't actually have much support from the local population. Um, so if, if Connor has a question there over in yep. Zoom. Let's go ahead, Connor. Right. Um, Can I speak in a minute? So my, your last answer uh, slightly took away my, part of my question about their effectiveness, about their effectiveness in co combating the IRA. Um, I was just wondering, do you think that compared to other, uh, what's your answer, that compared to other efforts from, say, the police, from RIC or regular army, that that local knowledge made a big difference to how they were able to prosecute? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I have uh, examples. Um, uh, there are loads of examples of B specials simply going out to people's homes, knowing that they may have been mixed up in um, the, the, the IRA. For example, during the, the riots in Banbridge after uh, Smith's um, uh, burial, his funeral, I know this is pre-specials era, but if these people join the specials, uh, this is a good example of how they could um, combat the IRA. The rioters went straight to the home of the uh, Monaghans, who uh, Seamus Monaghan was a key member of the IRA in County Down, and they, I, I think they burnt the house down, and the, f the family ended up getting arrested by the police that day. Um, and once once the specials came into force, the, all that local knowledge uh, made it very difficult for the specials to operate. I think in County Down, Seamus Monaghan's um, successor, I think he was the local uh, OC of the IRA, um, his successor was also well known and also got arrested quite easily, and uh, and the, um, I think his successor had difficulty as well operating in the area. So the IRA never really took off in in that area, and then up in Antrim, um, people who were suspected of IRA activities um, were simply visited in the night and shot. Um, I have an example of um, a fellow called Archie McCann. Um, him and his uncle were, were targeted uh, in the middle of the night because they were suspected of taking part in a, an IRA ambush nearby and local B specials thought, well, we think it may be those boys, so let's go get them and just pet them a visit in the night. So that, that's local knowledge that you wouldn't necessarily get uh, if you had the RIC, whose full-time professional uh, police officers were not local people. 
in the RIC, you had to operate in a different district uh, or a different county to the one you uh, lived in. And the military obviously were, were uh, much broader than that. They were recruited from across Britain. So that, that local knowledge would have been completely lost. So yeah, the local, the local knowledge of the B specials uh, was very important. And when, when I looked at the, the recruitment, um, the, 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 the recruitment files, it was quite interesting to see how many farmers who knew the local area and how many postmen were actually recruited. That's why I called them out in my paper. They were very important because they knew everyone in the locality um, and they, they knew where everything was and where everyone lived. So no, that, that, that was a very, very important factor. Can I speak? Hello, hello can I speak? That's, that's Brian Walker from Queens. Oh, hello, Brian. Brian, your microphone's muted. So we can hear Yep, we can hear you. Oh, no, it's muted again. Sorry, Brian. Is that it? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, it keeps knocking off there, Bran. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to make two points. I'm sorry, Bran. It, it's knocked off again there. Maybe we give it one more chance. Brian, maybe we'll come back to you in a, in a minute, if that's okay. Um, there's a question from Dennis Agnew over on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> uh, he asks, uh, you mentioned the formation of the USC in 1920 came out of fear by loyalists or Protestants from attack by the IRA. Was this seen as a failure by the British government to keep the local people safe? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, it's hard to tell. I, I, I didn't really look at the British attitudes uh, towards this. Uh, they, they were very supportive of the specials. I think it was almost because it, it devolved the issue uh, into local hands, even before the proper devolution of security parts to Northern Ireland. Um, the, the, I, I know in that period, the attitude of the British government, it was, I think it was Charles Townsend called it a, um, a stoical um, attitude towards uh, Ulster Unionism, they, they, they did the right thing by them, but they weren't super supportive, uh, like they were in, during the Ulster crisis before the First World War. I think there was a willingness in the British government to push this issue back over to Ireland or Northern Ireland and keep it there, um, and the fewer British troops there, the better. Um, I honestly couldn't give you a more specific answer than that, um, but uh, it would be a good question to probably ask one of the speakers in the following few weeks um, who may know a bit more about the British government's attitudes to the wider conflict. Okay, thank you. Brian, have, have you got your microphone um, working there? Is that okay now? Yes, we can hear you now. Good. Just thank you very much for the very interesting paper. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes. Good. Uh, I want to make two points, please. Uh, you, you mentioned about division commanders fit uh, a species supposed to have made uh, that the police could shoot with impunity. Uh, it's worth pointing out that that has been challenged. I mean, he challenged it himself fairly strong. And uh, this inspector, uh, John Regan, who went through the full battle, said even the lady said that. And the men who reported that were witness, who he would question that. So I do want to point out that it's alleged he said that. Um, there's an argument that he didn't, but it, it, nonetheless, it was believed he said, and that's why he was kidding. Yeah. That's my first point. The second point is, uh, so there's a lot of criticism I think one can make of the V-Special in this period, but don't forget, they were critical of the survival of the state in 1922. And then by, by March, the RSC was being disbanded. The RSC has been set up, it's not operational. Uh, the British Army at this stage is very much reduced numbers, a lot of regiments are disbanded. So at this stage, at this stage, when there's a sustained campaign against the state, uh, the B-Special actually play a very important part. And so I think it's worth pointing out that 
one can make a very valid criticism about them, but nonetheless, the role they played was important. And uh, quite a lot of them lost their lives. I'm not sure the number of them, uh, but this was important for the survival of the state. Uh, and when one criticizes the violence on the side of the state at this time, remember that the southern state was now about to go into a civil war uh, when violence would be equally meted out. Uh, so unfortunately, these are very violent times we live in, uh, and therefore this is not unexpected, unfortunately. Okay? Yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right, uh, Brian. Uh, the words of uh, Smith and the style, that they were alleged. Um, I I read uh, it was Jeremiah Mee's account. Um, you're absolutely correct. It is alleged, but it was the perception that he said that that led to his to his assassination, as you as you mentioned. Um, and the USC's role in the survival of Northern Ireland, I absolutely went down it. I mean, um, the the violence they carried out it, it was obviously very brutal at times, but it nevertheless delivered the end result of the survival of the state and the defeat of the IRA, or at least it contributed. There was obviously other, other factors, such as the start of the Civil War in the South. Um, yeah, absolutely, I, I, I wouldn't dispute that, uh, that the, the importance of their, of their violence, or of their, of their contribution to survival of the state, sorry. Thank you. Um, so just the last question there, um, Chris, uh, this is from Robert. Sure. Um, I hope you've seen uh, the, the museum's virtual exhibition, but uh, perhaps you can answer this. Um, you mentioned a name as being involved in, in the Swansea shooting. Was anyone charged or convicted of the Swansea shooting? One person, yeah. Um, what was his name? Sean Leonard. Uh, I think he was the driver of the taxi uh, cab that was waiting to take the assassins back to Belfast. He was, uh, I think he was a Monaghan man. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kieran, uh, on that. Um, but he, he was convicted. Uh, and he later had his sentence commuted, I think. Um, but they didn't find the, actu the people who actually carried out the shooting. There were four of them, uh, two from Cork, two from Belfast, if I remember correctly. And it was just on the corner of, um, of well, just outside this building, on the corner of Railway Street, where Swansea lived as he returned home from, from church. Uh, the, the men who pulled the trigger were never, were never, were never um, discovered. I think the ones who were from Cork, they went to Belfast and jumped straight on the train back south and got out of there. Uh, so they, were not, they weren't going to be caught by, by the local police, absolutely not. And I think carrying out an investigation right in the aftermath of Swansea's killing was deterred a little bit by the ferocious rioting that broke out immediately afterwards, I think. Uh, I, I couldn't work out exactly what time the first house was burnt down, but uh, it was probably within the hour. So I don't think the local police could do a, a, a thorough investigation and interviews with everyone to carry out a proper a proper um, investigation of what, what happened. So yeah, one person got, got arrested and imprisoned, but he didn't actually pull the trigger. Uh, that's great, so there's no more questions. Um, Excellent. Can I just thank Chris, um, thank you all for taking part, uh, virtually attending this evening. Uh, can I thank Peter, who's looking after all the tech in the corner. I know there was a slight delay with the Zoom, but we'll, we'll iron out any problems and get that sorted um, for next week. And next week, we're looking forward to having uh, Pierce Lawler, a uh, local author and historian, and he's going to tell the story of the Lisburn burnings. Um, so thank you all and good evening. <laughs>